Hello, all. <laughs> I think I was a little late in making the announcement. Anyway, uh, what I wanted to talk about today is, or this afternoon, are the complications that aren't considered complications. Uh, earlier today, we had talked about the fact that somebody who makes these definitions have decided that complications are things that are added to basic time telling uh, hours minutes and seconds and so a moon phase would be a complication uh, a uh, uh, chronograph would be a co complication i suppose a power reserve indicator would be a complication anything that is adds something to it on the other hand uh things that are to to keep a constant force Hi, Neo. Uh, things that are there to keep a constant force uh, don't really have a name. And so I decided to call them complicated constant force mechanisms. So uh, that will differentiate them from complications, even though often they're more complicated. And the ones that I want to talk about and get your opinion on are a number of these, plus any ones you can think of. The how you doing, Junior? Uh, so the so the ones that um, that I have in mind are the Rimantat Egalite, the Fusee and Chain, Tourbillons, uh, Double Hair Springs, Big Balance Wheels. I've got a bunch in here that are intellectual properties. <laughs> so uh, we've got a lot of things we can talk about. Hi, Lix. How you doing? Uh, hey, football fan, how's it going? How's Washington doing this year? Thomas, good to see you. So, anywho, uh, that's pretty much what I thought would be a good discussion. Hi, Mark. Oh, that's another one. Mark uh, Mark is a big uh, F.P. Jorn fan and one of the, one of the most likable uh, complications for complicated constant force mechanisms is the double barrel and parallel. Great thing. So you have both uh, of the main springs working to even out the amount of work that has to be done so that there is a more even flow or better timekeeping. So that's another one we can talk about too. Um, what are some other ones when we talk, you know, thinking about constant force other than the ones that I mentioned um, and the uh, both the agon pit and the agonies that uh, the intellectual properties of agon are <laughs> that they put in our watch. What are some other kinds of things that are developed to keep things, keep a constant force going? Um Oh, I know one, another one I just thought of, and that's the, uh, it's referred to oftentimes as a Maltese cross. And essentially what it does, it pops back and rewinds the mainspring after a certain certain amount. And so that the, the or at least it, it uses a part of the mainspring that's, that's constant. So that first when it's really tight, uh, and fast versus the end when it's loosened up a lot and not as fast. And so by using that middle portion. Okay, so put on your thinking caps and let's get some, let's get a discussion going here. First of all, in any of your watches, and Mark, I've already, I'm sorry, Mark, I've already named yours. There may be, a, there may be other ones in there too, but what would be a constant force uh, complication that was added to your watch, any watch that you have. Uh, if you have a tourbillon, that would be an example. Any, anybody have a tourbillon? They, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I've never really gone out of my way to get a tourbillon, even of, even one that I could afford, is that the most of them just work with a pocket watch uh, pretty much in, in one position. And uh, so that was one of the reasons. And plus the fact they're quite expensive and very, very, very complicated. 
Fuzian chain, they're big. Uh, and there's hardly any watches, that's, uh, at least uh, wrist watches, that have them. If you want to find a Fuzian chain, the place to look is in a pocket watch. And so you can get, you can, you know, if you want to just to, to add a, a Fuzian chain to your collection. Oh, let's see. Thomas, uh, the Fuzian chain mechanism used by uh, Ferdinand Berthold is a great con. Yeah, it is. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Berthold had them. You know, another company, uh, Alanga Unsunda, had them too. And, um, but not a lot of other ones have had that. I think if you look around uh, some, you can find some more, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, Ferdinand Berthold is one of my favorite watchmakers. What are some other um, mechanisms that um, Trigonal Bridge and a Gerard Perigo? I don't know Gerard Perigo's had a Trigonal Bridge, but uh, my um, Langenheim has a Trigonal Bridge. And uh, but that's the thing about a Trigonal Bridge is my understanding is, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is that it allows you to see all of the gearing in the back. So when you turn the watch over with a trigonal bridge, you can see most of the gear train. Uh, and uh, that's what Marco Lang uh, had it for. I didn't realize that uh, Jard Perigo had one too. Um, Washington, what, what's the, um, the, what model of Jard Perigo has that? Uh oh, uh, that's something. Uh, what silicon mechanism is that, Thomas? There's this. Um, hi, Truman. It's evening. It's here. It's afternoon. Hi, Graham. I, I guess it's good evening on on the on the rock where Graham lives, right? Thomas um, Guernsey, right. Oh, what mechanism is it, Thomas? I didn't, um, the only mechanism I can imagine that Gerard Perigo would use a silicon in uh, might be in the escapement. But the thing about, um, there's a really difference between silicon in an escapement and silicon in a hairspring. If you have silicon in the escapement, they work exactly like uh, a an escapement made out of transitional metals. In other words, of you know the pallet fork, the uh, the ju the um, oh, what are they called uh, the the uh, ruby pallets, uh, and then the escape wheel. They they work exactly in one or the other. The advantage in that case is simply a lower um, magnetism, a possibility of magnetism. But I don't even I didn't I didn't know that they used it at all. To tell you the truth. Hi, Watts Nichols. How you doing? Um. Okay. What are some other uh s s some other ones that um, let me tell you a, a little about this. This is, this is something I didn't know about. Um, in our watch, they put in this thing called the agony, agonize wheel of our gear. Okay. Now the, the distance from the center right here of that's the, uh, where the center of the, uh, a wheel train is or gear train and anything over here uh the distance uh, is going to cause certain little funny things that the that the second hand might do and in order to cut down on any kind of jerkiness what they have this gear has <laughs> springs in it and so each tooth acts like a little clothespin and it grabs the tooth until it, it releases it. And 
what that does, it gives you greater stability. I wish you could see it. It's really a cool looking one. I don't know. I'll see if you can see it there or not. It is, uh, from your view, it's the opposite side as a crown. And unfortunately, there's a little sort of peekaboo thing right here where you can see it. So that's one. The other one is look, look how different this thing right here is the um, Agon Pit regulator. But look how different that looks from a regular from a regular regulator. It doesn't look anything at all like it. And that's because it's not. And it was uh, designed as a way to to really improve the uh, the regulator and the way regulation is done, regulating both the uh, beat and the um, as as well as the uh, frequency on them. Hi, Lix. Armstrong gravity equal force uses a Maltese cross. That's a great example, Lix. Thank you. Uh, the Maltese crossing is wild. As I I I, I love that thing. It just the old thing comes unwound to a certain point and then winds it back up. I'm not sure how it does that though. I mean, there's a it's sort of an interesting mechanism that rewinds itself, and I'm not quite sure how that's done. Now with a remontois uh d'egalite, you have a little spring, and that's rewound by pressure from the main spring, but I'm not sure how they do that with a Maltese cross. Hi, Javi. How are you doing? It's a silicon escapement spring. Escapement spring? What is the escapement spring, Thomas? That sounds really interesting. I've never, I, uh, this is in a constant escapement, they have an escapement spring. That's interesting. I got to find out more about that, and I will. Anything more you can tell us about that, Thomas? How does it work and what does it do? Well, anyway, uh, a constant escapement uh, that is uh, Gerard Perigo's constant escapement. You learn something new. We all do. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, what are some other things that are are used on that? In your watches, there's got to be something in your collections. There's a video. Okay, I'll check out the video on YouTube. Um, what are some other other ones that uh, that you have, and and whether they make a difference or not? Okay. Uh, by the way, too, there's a, um, a Hodinkee article on the uh, Gerard Perigo constant force escapement, and it explains how to do it. They have a picture of what it would be a, a Swiss escapement, where you have the uh, the escape gear, and then you have the little uh, uh, pallet for rocking back and forth. The one, the constant escapement, uh, uses a, I didn't, wasn't sure what that is. Are you sure that's silicon they make that that big thingy out of? They got this, it's really an incredible thing. I'd read about it a long time ago. I forgot it was Gerard Perigo. Uh, it, let me see.
Anyhow, what I'm going to do for everybody, being such a nice guy, take a look at this one. This is a thing that, um, yeah, check out this uh, article uh, in Hodinkee. Um, they use the constant force escapement, right? That's it. That, there's an article about it with some videos on that uh, link that I sent you. So that's a that's a that's another one that's really very very interesting. Somebody else, I think Zenus also had something like that, but I could be mistaken. Um, and yeah, so that's that would be one. But it, I didn't. Eh, maybe hang on a second. Yeah, they use something that's called a silicon blade. Uh, and they ha have this sort of like, a, almost like a, a butterfly. And, but sure enough, that is very much uh, the silicon blade. Uh, Anyway, yeah, okay, yeah, you got that one right. Yeah, no, you heard silicon. Yeah, the last twenty percent is the most erratic, right? Uh, I had an IWC Portugueser with two barrels. Some mechanism prevented each barrel from using at the last twenty percent. Yeah, there, there, there. Oh boy, there are really a couple of different things going on. With double barrels, you have uh, one is sequential or serial, and the other is um, uh, parallel. And what the parallel do? They work together. The uh, the dual barrels work. One when one poops out, the other one goes. So. Anyway, that's uh, on that. This one. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, Thomas, you really pulled an interesting thread here. And so, sort of like, there's, you can find a similar type of constant force escapement both in the Wooten Lanen uh, Observatory uh, watch, which is not a, a Wooten Lanen movement. He uses another base movement, but he puts that in. The other one is uh, the Dufour Simplicity, which is probably one of the most incredible watches ever made in terms of having all of the right simple things. Hey, Rancher, how you doing, man? Hey, least time. Adam, how are you? Go Michigan. <laughs> okay, well, that's, uh, that's I, I tell you, the whole thing about that, that is very interesting, this thing that uh, Gerard Perigo, uh did on that with silicon. And this is, uh, this is a, boy, it's a pretty new article. It's, it's uh, from uh, November uh 26 that's today so it's a brand new article ahead and i think thomas was holding it for us because <laughs> hey watch nicholas what's up game over huh well that's too... oh is it did michigan win or who's going let's go blue all right junior and i high fragrance profile <laughs> thank you okay least time let's see what you got here uh, this week, the patent on silicon hairsprings expired. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I do know some other companies are looking at it. Um, 
and so they may there may be more of the um, there may be more of it uh haraj is on to something in this respect you know that's something haraj seemed to be going they the some of the early stuff on haraj looked I don't know, a little dumpy for my taste, but they've come a long way, uh, and I hope they don't take a take the wrong turn. It's sort of a fork in the road. Either you can go to our craftsmanship, our silicon. <laughs> yeah, I know there'll be more of them. Here's the thing: they're cheaper to make. And uh, they work better than traditional hairsprings, except you can't adjust them. And by working better, I mean they they withstand heat uh, and cold better. They keep their form better, uh, and they're totally non-effective uh, by uh, well heat and cold. But you can't your uh, 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 magnet, that's it. There's no magnetic magnetization to them. So they may, you know, they may be the thing of the future. The watchmakers that I've talked to, like Bruton Lannan and the guys at uh, Aganor and a lot of other of the traditional watchmakers won't have a thing to do with them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I, I'd be interested to see what... Um, Wooten Lannan does with uh, Urban Jorgensen, whether that they may experiment some with them or not. Uh, that will be very interesting. But I will I will be sort of the, the curmudgeon who says, you know, if you're not if you can't if you can't figure out uh, like uh, both Rolex did with the par parachrome and um Precision engineering that H. Moser did with the Strawman hair string, you know, you can get these, you know, put them in a microwave and get these sheets of uh, of uh, silicon air springs out. Cost a lot to develop, but once developed, they're real, they're very easy. The the one of the few skills that I think uh, neither George Daniels nor um, Oh, what's his name? Smith, Roger Smith, developed the, was making their own hairsprings. That process is a pain in the neck uh, compared to doing it with silicon. And I think this is sort of the view of well, let's do it with silicon because it's you know it's more affordable and it works better. <laughs> you know, I, I'll get an Apple Watch if I want that. Uh, Yeah, magnet. Yeah, it's sort of like non. They're not anti-magnetic. In fact, I'm not. They they use that term as anti-magnetic, but they're sort of non-magnetic. They're totally unaffected by magnets. Um. Uh, hi, Vladimir. How you doing, Adam? Let's see. Do you like uh, the oh, Beat Haldeman's H two? Yes, I do. Now. That one, uh, doesn't the H2 use, isn't that a type of Rimantois? Sort of like a, I'm not positive though. I know that Beat, and you probably don't say it Beat, but Beat Holderman did have something like that. A magnetic, that's probably the best way to talk about it uh, least time. That's a good, good, good description. It's a magnetic. Um, it's, it's also a temperature too, and a, a lot of other things. And it's used by A's. <laughs> okay. Let's see what you got here. Like a, like a gent, <laughs> a gent. Um, oh, a flying tourbillon. Oh man, those things are something. Flying tourbillon, or have you seen those? The tourbillons that they set up instead of flat, they they go out. They're vertical, like a I don't know, vertical or horizontal uh, tourbillon. Those things are supposed to work pretty well. Hey, watch student. <laughs> 
I don't want to get you expelled from watchmaking school. So hang in there. Yes, it's a lot lighter than metal. Uh, uh, composite, it is. I mean, there are lots. I, I always said, yes, there's tons of advantages, except you can't, you can't adjust them. But you, by and large, you don't have to. They, it's sort of like getting something. That's the black box thing about it. You can't do anything with it. It's in this black box of this inflexible uh, silicon that keeps its shape and heat and cold and all of these other things. Uh, you can't adjust the beat though. So that's that's the beat refers to the swing and the extent to which the swing one way and the swing the other is the same. You have good uh, good beat. By the way, too. Is there a beat uh, constant force you can think of? Ms. Dane, you may like to, to you know, let us know if there's something that uh, that you know about that. That'd be great. Uh, it's yeah, okay. It's a lighter thing too. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, there was F.P. Jorn visited a place called, I think it was called the Firehouse, this place in San Francisco that makes um, silicon hair springs. I don't know what, what he did there or anything else, but he, he visited there. I also know that um, Otto Kalpa was interested in making, uh, of offering a hair spring. Now, they, they're making... Good grief. I don't know. I think hundreds and thousands of hair springs. That's one of the companies that does it. So, oh boy. Uh, here we got it again. Let's see. Hide. <laughs> oh my God. All right, here we go. Report. Boom. <laughs> we can. Hey. Okay. And report. So yeah, I'm getting uh, people trying to put up pornography on on our discussion, and I know some of you may be upset that I I I don't have it, but you know. You, you've got the internet. Who needs it here? Okay, there we go. Okay. Hi, Foreman. Uh, is that a, a metaphor for life? Constant force is the unerring stress of living, but you can adjust your beat. You know, that's a, that Foreman, that's a good point. Maybe that's what it is. Um, I don't know. It depends on. I I think it depends on the choices you make, uh, where there's more or less pressure. There's certain ones that are pretty mellow uh, lifestyles, and other ones that are full of pressure. You know, uh, when I was at the uh, at San Diego State University, I was there for 15 years, and there was this guy, forgot his name, but um, he used to come out and spend a year in San Diego at the University of California at San Diego. And uh, he's from, I think, uh, either the City University of New York or one of those. And he said, he said that he said to you know, live in New York City, you got to be tough, and you know, there's pressure all the time. Is you know, you got to watch yourself walking down the street, and, you know, and so forth. He says, you come out to San Diego, and nothing happens. It's just sort of nice weather every day, and it's mellow. And you know, then you have to go back to New York but you're sort of gassed up, but you miss sort of all of the action there. And I, I sort of understand it's sort of a mix of, of mellow and, and stress. What's going on? No, I, uh, I don't know what happened to him. I didn't even know about them uh, in the first place. You know, sometimes, though, you can find companies i mean you can find really good watchmakers who had a shot at it and didn't make it and you can pick up their uh, watches for some good deals on the uh, used watch market 
Uh, JLC Atmos. There you go. Now, that's an interesting clock. Yeah, that's a very interesting watch. Longa uses constant force in the Richard Long perpetual calendar, I think. Also, the Longa 31. You know, there's usually some kind of constant force mechanisms in most watches. I think right now, my very favorite constant force is a big balance wheel. A balance wheel has, once you get it going, the inertia, it has much better, I mean, it's it's going to keep going. And I'm trying to think, some of the watches, I was looking at some watches that Moritz Grossmann had, and they had these wonderful big balance wheels uh, in some of them. There's a huge one that was in one of the um, Gronfeld brothers' uh, watches. I think it was called One Hertz or something. They had this gigantic uh, balance wheel. That's not the kind I'm talking about. I'm talking about ones that are big. Maybe they take up uh, the radius of the of a um, of a dial uh, of the size or uh, movement uh, area. And that's something I think I would I would like to see more of a nice, just sort of a real simple time only watch with a great big uh, balance. Uh, where's Miss Dane? If you're in watch school, that would be a good that would be a good senior project. Okay, let's see. Um, Oh, oh yeah, Letter. His stuff is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, he's one of the top guys watching. I agree. The bigger the balance wheel, the bigger the force which can be applied without uh, beating your watch. There you go, John. Nicely put. Least time, any uh, recommendation for 70s, 80s watch from Cartier or Jaja Lacoutre? Cartier, you got to be pretty careful because they they had they were using all kinds of different movements at, at one time. And and I'll, I'll tell you one thing to stay away from: must de Cartier junk that was from the seventies. These couple, I think they were brothers that took over, and it was very successful. It was successful junk, but it was junk anyway. Uh, hey Homer, how you doing? Um. Nigel, I, I, there is a cat that just stuck its head out of the bag, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I, I have an idea that after these next two, we're going to have to take a look at. A central impulse chronometer. Ooh, boy, that sounds neat. That sounds like a wonderful watch uh, complication. Oh no, frying pan, <laughs> it's time to go. Oh, it is. Oh my God, it's over frying pan time. I'm going to get in trouble. All right, guys. Uh, well, listen, thank you all. You had wonderful ideas. This was, I, I'm afraid I got more out of it this time than you did. And uh, that was my plan. <laughs> so have, enjoy the rest of the weekend and uh, see you next week.